more difficult story um, that I don't tell very often was uh, after the murder of my mother here in Eugene when 1998 she came down to try to help a mentally ill family member, a cousin, and uh, who ended up stabbing her to death. How do you make sense out of that tragedy? Well, you know, where was God? The age-old question. Um, Mom had a dog, and she loved that dog. My sister said, "Where's, where's the dog? Where's Wiki?" I said, well, why do you care about Wiki? You know, our mother is probably dead. Why do you care about Wiki? She says, if you find Wiki, you will find Mom. So I called up the sheriff and I said, any chance you found a dog at the scene? Sheriff says, oh, yeah. He says, he says that dog was so fierce. He says, uh, we had to bring in animal control in order to subdue the dog so we could get near the, near the body. And uh, I realized there was God. You know, mom didn't die alone. She was there. And uh, God was using what was available to God. A little dog to provide comfort and protection, such that it was. You know, and so that too um, has become a very um, powerful metaphor in my own life and how sacred all life is. Um, and our call to, to preserve life and the sacredness and the specialness of all life. I grew up as a son of a, of a preacher. I, it was uh, in high school that I you know, made the determination that I wanted to go into the ministry. People then went back to this position in our uh, general headquarters in Indianapolis. Uh, that kind of experience of being in touch with these global Christian leaders and hearing their stories and being moved by their stories um, and then working with our national leaders uh, in Indianapolis, uh, people who were very connected to the peace movement. Uh, I ended up going to Phillips University in Oklahoma to finish my undergraduate degree. And, um, and, and did a little bit of work in my undergraduate graduate degree on some of those issues, I, uh, my major, a double major in religion and political science, because I thought the two, you know, worked well together. And because of my interest in peace uh, causes, got uh, involved with a, a peace organization in Berlin called Action Reconciliation Service for Peace, is the English name. And they took uh, uh, mostly, um, you know, college age, young adults, but, but a lot of different folk and to these countries, uh, Great Britain, France, Belgium, uh, even Poland, um, and rebuilt things and spent a week in Auschwitz. Um, and that was probably, you know, one of the most profound experiences I had, where we spent time um, just doing basic labor, cleaning out exhibits, pulling weeds, you know, doing a variety of things. And then, uh, uh, and in the afternoons, we would read through uh, files, SS files. It was there in that place that f for the first time I heard the story of Eli Wiesel uh, that he tells in one of his books, and I've forgotten now which one it is, but he, he tells the story of, of witnessing the execution of four um, uh, people who tried to escape from the camp and failed or caught, and typical of the Nazis, they're made an example of, and uh, the way they would do that is they'd hang them publicly and parade all of the inmates by to witness the hanging. The problem in this particular one was one of the escapees was a young boy, 10, 12 years old, um, and his body weight was not heavy enough to break his neck. As a result, he struggled terribly there hanging 
the other three died fairly quickly. And Wiesel tells the story of hearing one of the inmates as they're all parading by, witnessing this horrendous thing of someone crying out, my God, my God, you know, where are you? And the voice inside of Wiesel says, he is there hanging from the gallows. Um, and I, and when I heard that story, I mean, I'm, I'm there in Auschwitz hearing this story told for the first time sitting with these German youth, working through their own personal history and involvement, and working on all of this stuff. And for me as a Christian who worships the crucified Christ, you know, and to make that connection to that story. And it was like this, you know, this moment that just sent shivers down my spine and, and uh, uh, just had a very powerful impact in it. Every single one of those youth said, I am not responsible for what my parents did, or my grandparents and so forth. I am responsible as a German to see to it that it never happens again. And that, that became the overarching theme of, of, of the work of the organization and, and why these German youth are so dedicated in what they do. Um, and, and they carry that with them wherever they go. Um, and um, and so for me, <clears throat> then to s start thinking, you know, what am I, you know, what's my responsibility as an American? Mm -hmm. When I finished that, uh, I, I then went to seminary, went to Claremont, uh, Southern California, um, a Methodist school. That course of theology after the Holocaust was we looked at, you know, fifteen hundred years of Christian history of anti-Semitism, of how it was the official policy of the church to discriminate against Jews because they were responsible for the death of Jesus, and how that led to the Holocaust. And, and, and you know, the, the, the Holocaust is absolutely unthinkable without that 1,500 years of anti-Semitism. And, and to become aware of that uh, was an incredibly you know, profound experience for me and very upsetting. And, and then to realize I have that responsibility as a Christian. It's no longer just about me as an American, you know, but I'm not responsible for what my Christian forefathers and mothers have done, but I am responsible as a Christian to see to it that it never happens again. And so you overlay that on, you know, as an American and, and, and both of those things. Uh, you know, there is a, an incredibly heavy burden on us as Christian Americans. The responsibility that we have to ensure that the kinds of things that have been committed in our name do not happen again. As I finished seminary, graduated in 1984, uh, there was this movement called the Jesus Seminar that started the next year in 1985. Uh, Marcus Borg from uh, Carvallis, uh, uh, co-chair, the other co-chair, John Dominic Crossan. What, what really changed for me, what really opened my eyes, was the understanding that the primary work of both Jesus and Paul was to offer an alternative to the empire of their day. The Christianity has become too, um, you know, enmeshed with the normalcy of civilization, to use a term of, of Dominic Cross, and with the empires, uh, with the way things are, with capitalism, with, with um, you know, the structures of society. So, you know, my, my interest in the whole issue of anti-Semitism, I think, uh, um, is what led me to become very involved when the uh, temple was shot up with uh, automatic weapon fire in 1994, I think that was, and led a 10-day vigil. That has also led me to be very involved in interfaith work and, and developing and supporting the interfaith community. So that's coming together as an interfaith community to engage in prayer together truly is creating a vision for, for world peace that is essential. The world truly can be a different place than what it is, and that we do have the ability to create that.